Half of the Brooklyn Park Osseo Maple Grove League of Women Voters. Can we have quiet in the audience, please? I would like to welcome you to the Senate District 34 Candidate Forum. I'm Cindy Shevlin Woodcock, moderator for tonight's discussion. The forum will run from 6.30 to 7.05. The Brooklyn Park Osseo Maple Grove League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any political party or candidates. The League of Women Voters has a long-standing history of providing unbiased candidate and issue information that is widely used by voters, regardless of their political beliefs. We sponsor tonight's forum as a public service to the community. It is your opportunity to hear from the candidates, discuss important issues face to face, and remember that the views expressed tonight are those of the candidates and not the League of Women Voters. We will start the candidate forum with, an op with opening statements. Each candidate will be given two minutes for their opening and closing statements. Opening statements will be in alphabetical order, whereas closing statements will be in random order. Throughout the forum, <clears throat> the order of questioning will be rotated. Candidates will have one minute to respond to questions. Candidates, please note there are timekeepers who will signal you by raising the signs when you have 30 seconds, 15 seconds, Oh, just 15 seconds, and um, when it's time to stop talking. <laughs> Let's begin with opening statements from each candidate. John Hoffman will begin, followed by Melissa Hortman. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you to the League of Women Voters. I love the fact that I get to go first because, you know, uh, Madam Speaker should actually go first, but I thank you very much. My name is John Hoffman. I'm your current senator, and I'm married to my wife, Yvette, of 29 years. She's here tonight. It's her birthday. So of all things, she's celebrating her birthday with us. Um, I started my public service working locally on the Enoch Hennepin School Board and served as its vice chair. You know, I've always believed in common good and common ground. And you know, do we agree all the time? Absolutely not. But working from that place is where we can agree. That's progress. That's the Minnesota way. That's how we've always been about. You know, I've talked to you um, to heart what, what then uh, Congressman Jim Ramstead told me when I served on the Federal Interagency Coordinating Council in Washington, D.C. He said, the work of education and health and human services, you leave your ego in the hallway and you focus on what matters at hand. It's not about you, but it's rather about what, what it is that you want to accomplish. And I took that to heart. And so that's how I looked at when I developed the bills that, that I've been part of in our area. And you know, and I listened to you and, and I worked hard for you because you said to me, I don't care what party you are, will you just get something done? And I said, yes, I can do that knowing on what Jim Ramstead had talked about and what we wor uh, worked on the school board, right? And, and as you look around the district, the work that I've done in a, in a bipartisan and a collaborative way is imprinted all over our district, from the Mill Pond in Champlin to Brooklyn Park Armory to the, to the Mississippi Gateway in Brooklyn Park. If you look around those park systems in 101st and 169 and the improvements um, on, on 101st, you know, that passed legislation, we modernized highways, we do some fund critical bridge updates, and, and, and with that I've also got 24 endorsements. Minnesota police and peace officers as well as the nurses and firefighters. I believe we build a better future together. I will continue to be that leader that works across political parties. I am John Hoffman, I'm asking for your vote November 8th. Thank you. Melissa? Good evening, and thank you for having me. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for the work that you do to inform the community about the candidates and the issues in the election in the nonpartisan way that you do that. Uh, like Senator Hoffman, I am a married resident of the district. I have uh, two adult children, and I am currently a dog parent to a golden retriever named Gilbert, uh, whose best skill is being naughty. Uh, when I first ran for office way back in 1998, um, the things that drove me were to improve funding for the Anoka Hennepin School District, the Osseo School District, 
and to improve transportation infrastructure for the communities of Brooklyn Park and the North Metro area that I represent. And those are still the issues that really drive me the most today. Those are issues where there shouldn't be a lot of partisan disagreement. We should be able to find common ground and get things done. Over my years of service for this community, that's exactly what I've done time and time again. Over the last four years, I've had the honor and privilege to serve as the Speaker of the Minnesota House. At the same time, the Minnesota Senate has been led by a Republican leader, and I have had cordial relationships and had very successful agreements with the Republican leaders of the Minnesota Senate whenever that was possible. And we had some really um, important steps forward for the state of Minnesota. This year, we got a uh, few very important things done. We repaid the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. We provided bonuses for our frontline workers. We worked together to lower the cost of health insurance for those folks in the individual market. And we made sure that those who are working on the front lines are taken care of if they should get COVID while they get sick. It's been, as I said, my honor and privilege to serve this community. I hope to do so for another two years and I ask for your vote. Thank you. <laughs> We're having a little consultation over here. So candidates, um, thank you for your opening statements and giving the audience a chance to learn a little bit more about you. Now we will start with the first question, which was received in advance. No, these are from the audience. Um, this will be question one out of, oh, probably 10 or 12 that we'll get to. You have one minute to respond. And again, because we go alphabetical, John goes first. The question is, how do you plan to make taxes fair and simple? Thank you, Cindy, and thank you for that question. When I was first elected in 2012, uh, the first eight years prior to my election, we talked about equalization of property taxes, right? It's fair and simple if you really think about it, even though you want to get in the weeds on it, it's tough, right? But those districts that are property poor, for example, Brooklyn Park, Champlain, you got a $100,000 piece of property and you tax that piece of property to the max, $214, $100,000 piece of property, $214 to get $900 from the state of Minnesota, money that you pay into taxes. If you take that same piece of property and you put it out in YZ or Orono, that gets taxed $74 to get $900. That's an equalization, right? So one of the first things we did was try to equalize that, to make it fair, make it balanced. And that's where, if you look at that perspective, that's where it's at, and that's where we'll continue to be at. We still need to do that, because even if you look now, Osseo School District, I just was there last night having conversations, and, and how they leverage their taxes in order to get per pupil, it's absolutely less. Anoka Hennepin's worse. YZ and those still get more, so. Would you like me to repeat the question? That would be great. Okay. Um, how do you plan to make taxes fair and simple? Well, I'd like to agree with what Senator Hoffman stated. Really, there's a focus in our area on making sure we get good, strong state funding for our schools so that we don't have to rely on the property tax. Because as he correctly stated, those of us in the North Metro area, because generally there's less commercial and industrial property here, we pay more when there's a local levy or a referendum. So in order for taxes to be fair, they have to be equally burdensome across the state. It's a, the price we all pay to live in a civilized society. And whether that's uh, having the right money that we need to pay for our local police and fire, or having the money we need to pay for our local school system, it's important that the state is a good partner to even out those variances in each local community's ability to tax their residents. And when you look at states across the country, um, I think Minnesota is doing a good job, but we can do better at relying more on the state and less on local property taxpayers. Thank you. <clears throat> the second question, uh, Melissa will go first and then John. What will, I don't know that word, <laughs> sorry. Let's see if we can get it in context. What will blank do to create livable wages for this, those who care for our most vulnerable? So I think it's legislate, what will the legislature do? 
Uh, that's a, a great question and one that uh, Senator Hoffman and I have been working closely on together over many years. We do believe that those who care for our most vulnerable in society deserve a pay increase. And over the years, um, as other different parts of our economy have had the opportunity to increase wages, um, the Target store, the Quick Trip, uh, we have seen those in uh, the personal care industry have their wages really stuck because we rely on the federal and the state government to pay reimbursements. And it's on our shoulders to increase the rates that we're paying. Unfortunately, we have at times struggled mightily to get our Republican colleagues in the House and in the Senate to agree with us and increase the wages of those who are caring for those folks who are elderly, those folks with disabilities, and others who need to be cared for. But you can count on me to continue to fight for those wage increases. Thank you. John, do you want me to repeat the question? No, I'm fine. Okay. The, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for actually, you know, hitting that. You know, it, it's, it's the legislature that decides how money is sent to wavered services that take care of our long-term care, right? And it's unfortunate in, in our federal government, when you see one Medicaid plan in a state, you've seen one Medicaid plan in the state. Every state has its own version of how Medicaid is being uh, distributed throughout uh, its system. And, and what that causes is this disconnect. So I got a nurse who's working in a wavered services program at a group home or at a long-term care facility, and because the reimbursement rates are set by the federal government to CMS and then handed down to the state saying, if you want anything higher than what our reimbursement rate is, you're gonna have to cough up the money for that. That's an imbalance. So you're gonna have to see two things happen, Cindy. You're gonna have to see our federal government get a little bit more aggressive and change the reimbursement rate structure. And secondly, in, in Minnesota, you know, we have a big surplus and there's a billion dollars that would actually stabilize our long-term care industry um, if we did it correctly and did it right. But it's gonna take a lot of work on doing that, so. Okay, thank you. Question number three, uh, John will go first and then Melissa. Why is protecting our elderly and people with disabilities so important? I get one minute, Cindy? Yes, That's one not, yeah. minute, John. <laughs> First of all, when you hear the conversation of equity, you hear the conversation of what we're doing to increase inclusion, very rarely are people with disabilities ever included in that conversation. And that's gotta be a discussion of intersectionality. I was on a call today with the child protection folks in the state, and they kept presenting it, and yet, here's the thing that bothered me. More people with disabilities, parents with disabilities, and children with disabilities are taken away from their natural home than anybody else, but nobody was putting that data, data sheet on there. And so Chair Pinto um, actually uh, said thank you and brought that forward saying that this is an action item that needs to be. It's important, one in five people in Minnesota live with a disability, one in 10 is chronic. And you know what, when we're talking about all means all, that means all means all. And that's what we, we deserve and we owe that to our greatest generation as our elderly get going. The first time in history, I know I got five seconds, we have more people 65 and older than we do in our K-12 education system. That tells you that there's some trends that need to be looked at heavy and hard. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa? Could you please repeat the question? Yes. Why is protecting our elderly and people with disabilities so important? Well, I think the question really answers itself. I think everyone in this room has somebody in their family who falls into the category of a person who's elderly or a person with disabilities who needs some help. And um, I think Senator Hoffman is really quite an expert and is extremely dedicated, has achieved so much in this area, first with his work for the federal government and um, his work as a senator. People seek him out. Uh, for his expertise in understanding how Minnesota's complex health and human services programs work to serve the people of Minnesota. And, um, you know, he has probably the number one commitment in the state legislature of making sure that these government programs that we structure are actually helping people and are actually meeting the needs that are out there. So uh, I share his commitment to services for uh, elder, the elderly and folks with disabilities and I really lean heavily on his expertise and his leadership in this issue area. Thank you. Uh, question number four will be um, Melissa first and then John. 
Why is intersectionality so important in public service? Well, I think the question gets at the issue of representation. So I think it's really important that the legislature looks like the state of Minnesota and is representative of all the people of Minnesota. Now that doesn't mean that women can't represent men and men can't represent women, people of color can't re represent white people and vice versa. But there's something about public confidence in our government when our government of the people, by the people, and for the people looks like the people that it's serving. So that means we need to have people from different communities all over the state. Minnesota is blessed with increasing diversity. It is a strength. We live in a diverse world. It is a competitive advantage. And it's been really exciting for me over the last six years to watch the incredible diversity that's grown in the Minnesota House DFL. I think we better represent the state because we have more viewpoints at the table. Thank you. John? Thank you, Cindy. Uh, like this afternoon when I had the conversation, you know, here's the data sets that we're talking about, you know, the protective orders within, you know, the child care protection work task force that it's on there, right? And, and, and none of the data sets actually brought in the conversation of intersectionality. We had to bring that up, right? And, and uh, it's really important because we don't live in silos, right? People don't just live in silos. There's all sorts of things that we interconnect and connect to, right? And there, there's the hints that you have that conversation. I said it with one of my staff the other day. I said, you know, believe it or not, you know, if you don't look at somebody in the construct of characteristic where they're at, what else do they live with? What else do they live with, right? All these things are going to intersect. We don't just live in silos anymore. And until government starts to realize it's just not a checkbox on there and really starts to look at true intersectionality like some of the uh, folks that have been, been, been leading on that, you know, in the state of Minnesota, then I think you truly get to what's the heart of what we can be about in Minnesota, which is, you know, that inclusive conversation, Madam Chair, right? When we say we include all, we all means all, right? Period. Good. Thank you. All right. This is question number five. It will be answered by John and then Melissa. <clears throat> Do you think the DHS should be split? If so, how would you think it should operate? The answer, simple answer to that is yes. It's a $26 billion corporation in a $52 billion um, state, right? And, and it handles everything from birth to death. And, and there's so many lanes of activities and work that they do. And, and it's by nobody's fault except the fact that as the needs of Minnesota started growing, the department got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'll give you one example. We have a problem with opioid addiction and, and, um, and addiction itself, right? And, and look at our neighbor, Anoka County. It's the fourth largest county, yet it has the second highest addiction overdose next to Hennepin County, right? So here's these two counties next to each other that really are saying, help us, we need some help here, right? And, and as, if you're looking at that, I believe you should pull out the behavioral health department, create its own entity. You should take Medicaid, set Medicaid, all the services under Medicaid. One state did it that was successful and it was Maryland. It was a Republican governor that actually put somebody in their cabinet level that oversaw all the Medicaid services and they looked at how those unique um, programs fit together with one another. So yes, there's a few other ones I'd give, but I ran out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa? Yes, I, I agree with uh, Senator Hoffman. It is a very large agency with a lot of different responsibilities. And what is very difficult is to have one individual who reports to the governor, who works for the governor, who is responsible for so many different areas. In the Minnesota House of Representatives, as the speaker, I created additional committees in the Health and Human Services area in order to have more people doing the work. It had always been the case that at the end of session, there was a traffic jam in terms of getting the Health and Human Services bill done because it was so much money and so many different services provided to so many different people. Instead of just having one Health and Human Services chair and one committee, I created four different committees one on behavioral health, one on preventative health, and then one on health uh, finance and one on human services finance, putting four people where before there had been one chair. And similarly, I think in the governor's cabinet, we need to find a way to have more people working in that area. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Question number six. 
we'll start with Melissa and then John. Given the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Roe versus Wade, state legislators may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. What measures, if any, do you think Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health? Yes, I think we need to be very clear in state law. Right now, we currently are protected by a Minnesota Supreme Court decision. However, a Republican uh, House and a Republican Senate could change that by putting a proposed constitutional amendment on the ballot. You know, we're hearing Republicans all over the state right now say, oh, Minnesotans, rights are completely protected, that's not an issue. Baloney, malarkey. Our right to abortion as health care is on the ballot this year. Um, it was incredibly stunning to me as a woman in America in 2022 to have my civil rights and liberties constrained by the US Supreme Court, a court that had typically been expanding rights over the last 50 years. And I, I think um, women in this state are angry and they are going to be showing up at the polls, and they should, because we are at risk. Imagine having, being pregnant with a fetus with a, a condition incompatible with life and having your own life at risk and having your OBGYN afraid to provide you the care that you need for fear of being put in prison. That's what we're seeing all around the country, and we will not see it here, not on my watch, as long as I'm in office. John? Thank you, Cindy. Um, Madam Chair, you got it right. It's, it is the conversation is really about body autonomy. It, it absolutely is about body autonomy. I'm a 57 year old male. I have no right to tell you what to do with your health care needs, wants, wishes, whatever, right? And then on top of that, when you mentioned it's civil rights, it's, it's that liberties, what's next? You know, what's next? Plessy versus Ferguson was a good bill. Is that what they're going to say? No. That upends Brown versus Board. That upends Tatro versus Texas. That upends. You just think about those things that are on the bill this year on November 8th. But it comes down, Cindy and, and, and folks, it is body autonomy. That is a woman's decision, not my decision to tell you what to do with that medical need. Thank you very much. <clears throat> question number seven will be John and then Melissa. And uh, the question comes from the audience. How will you move the U.S. towards a more green, sustainable economy? I miss being on energy and environment. When I was first elected in 2012, we were in the majority in the Senate, and Melissa was in the majority in the House. And do you remember the debate we had in conference committee over the solar standards? Minnesota had looked at solar standards for years. We were in a room debating, should it go 7%, 5%? We ended up getting at 1.5%, right? I will never forget that because the argument wasn't about me against you, but the argument was about what's the system ready to go toward. When you have um, Excel Energy saying, we're going to get certain goals met by 2035, we're going to get certain goals by 2050. And the things that they wanted to do when they wanted to shut down the three coal plants out in Becker, convert one to gas and utilize the other one, that's just on a, on a you know, fail. Uh, if something fails, they use it. But really, they were, they were getting their power from wind and from uh, a solar. So people are thinking outside the box. I think the industry is driving us there. And we just need to get out of the way and say, right, let's go. Um, if you could repeat the question. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> uh, how will you move the U.S. towards a more green, sustainable economy? Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate the question. There's so many aspects to that. One piece is definitely what uh, the senator spoke to about putting more clean and renewable energy on the grid. Given that our um, electricity sector is a fully regulated monopoly where we guarantee all the participants that they will get a certain rate of return and they will make a profit, policymakers and not the marketplace have to really drive progress. And so it was important that Minnesota set the renewable energy standard in 2007. It was important in 2013 that we pushed Excel a little bit further than they were comfortable going. And now they're around the country, they brag that they're the, the energy, the renewable energy um, leader. 
of the entire utility sector, and it's because of uh, Minnesota leaders like Senator Hoffman and I pushing in that green direction, but not pushing so far that they couldn't keep up. Um, but besides the electricity sector, the transportation sector, we have to look at, and then we have to look at aiding people in the transition, right? Being able to have clean, renewable energy, electrified transportation shouldn't be difficult for people of all income levels. Thank you. Question number eight will be Melissa and then John. And the question is, what would your top priorities be in the next legislative session? Well, I think we need to uh, complete the unfinished work of the last session. Um, in the 11th hour, the Republicans decided they didn't want to do anything that was good for the state of Minnesota because they didn't want to run the risk of Tim Walls looking good uh, before he was on the ballot versus their candidate. And so there were some very good work product that we were on the verge of passing that we should come back and take care of right away. First and foremost is a bonding bill. We do that once every two years in the state. We get a queue of construction projects that are then financed so we can keep improving our infrastructure and keep those jobs supplied for folks in the construction industry. Uh, the second thing is we need investment in our education system. Lots of children, lots of teachers, lots of professionals in our education system had a very tough go of it in COVID. And we really need to invest to help our students catch up and we also really need to invest so that people have the mental health services that they need. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, my first priority, there's some unfinished business on the table, long-term care. When, when I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, you have more people 65 and older than you do in the K-12 education system, that's just gonna do this. Our Medicaid response in the state of Minnesota goes from $1.1 billion to $3.6 billion. So the costs are going up. But yet at the same time, we know it costs less to make sure that folks have the in-home supports they need. Comes back to the first question you talked about, reimbursement rates, reimbursement. If we truly believe that you know, folks are gonna be better off in their homes, which we do believe because your health outcomes, health outcomes are better, then we need to really look at the home health care industry and saying, all right, how do we enhance and support them? Second one, as a co-author of the tax bill that got rid of Social Security uh, tax for people 65 and older, that's unfinished business. It was passed by the House and the Senate and it was just waiting to go to the governor. All we had to do is send it to the governor. It was passed. It made the conference committee. It was the way to go. That's still on there. And then, of course, there's some roads that need to be finished um, throughout this piece. If you've been up to Highway 10, that'll tell you. That's uh, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So one last question before we do closing statements. What is your approach to constituent services? And it will be John and then Melissa. Thank you, Cindy. You know, one of the, one of the biggest things is uh, talking about we as a, in the Senate, one, one senator represents 85,000 people. And so uh, we, we would hope that the constituent services side is uh, looked at in a fast and, and efficient manner. I have an open door policy. If you show up at the Senate, office and, and there happens to be somebody else in the room and you're a constituent, I actually have been known to get rid of the lobbyists. The, the, the constituents, my door is open. I mean open, literally. You can just show up and walk in. You know, don't need to make an appointment. Ask my LA. Um, sometimes we stack them. But it's fun because it's that's how it should be. It should be like having a kitchen table conversation. Your constituent services should be real authentic and, and it should be about the individuals that you're there to serve. And that's how I hope I've shown I've approached that way and this is how I want to approach it. So thank you. Melissa? It is one of the very most important things we do as state representatives. Obviously we go to the House and the Senate floor and we push a button, we vote yes or no on bills that, that involve spending all across the state and impact people all over the state. But the constituents who live in our districts, when they write in, when they call in, deserve to have somebody listen to what they're saying and respond to them. Uh, in the speaker's office, what I try to do is respond to as many people from around the state as we can or to direct them to their own state representative so that they get a response. When you think about that somebody was concerned enough about an issue, that they took the time out of their schedule to find out who their state legislator was and how to get in touch with them and to send them a request for information or for services, in my office, that is my highest priority for my staff 
to respond as quickly as possible and as thoroughly as possible to every constituent request. Thank you. You will now have two minutes for your closing statement to summarize your qualifications and your position, and we will go with Melissa first and then John. Well, um, as was stated at the beginning, my name is Melissa Hortman. I am a state representative for what was District 36B, what, what will now be 34B um, on your ballot, and I am asking for your vote. And I'm asking for your vote to continue my work to invest in public education, to make healthcare more affordable, both by the cost of insurance and the cost of our pharmaceuticals, and to make sure we have an economy that works for everyone and not just the wealthy few. At this point in our human history, we have to dedicate time and energy to preventing further exasper exacerbation of the climate crisis. We absolutely have to transition to a cleaner uh, economy. We also have to protect women's rights to control their own bodies and do what we can to adopt reasonable uh, measures to prevent gun violence because gun violence is ravaging our communities from suicides to crime. It is long past time that we take bold action to uh, prevent gun violence. And finally, democracy itself is under threat. It's very important that we make sure and count the votes that are cast and that nobody tries to put their political friends into power to say that the election turned out in a way other than it actually did. This election is so important. So in, in addition to um, campaigning for myself and telling you how important it is for me to earn your support and your vote, I want to strongly encourage you to vote for Steve Simon as Secretary of State and protect our democracy. Thank you for having me here this evening. John, oh, oh, no, stop. <laughs> we'll do that after John's done. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you to the League for holding this forum. It's absolutely enjoyable to be with the League of Women Voters in, in the forums, and, and how many you do from the city council all the way up into county commissioners, and it's, I was absolutely blown away, the volunteer hours that you do on that. And it comes down to this. Are you tired of the divisive politics where both sides just sit there and point fingers at each other and never get anything done? I am, and I have been. I pride myself in my ability to work across those political parties to get the job done that has delivered real results for our areas. And, and I talked about it early on. The pandemic was one of the hardest times for us, but I think we Minnesotans were resilient. We worked together to support our frontline workers like the speaker talked about and small businesses, and we're seeing that they're engaging stronger now than ever. But our work is not done, and we must ensure that the businesses that we support have the tools they need to grow and to hire workers locally. We need to local businesses actually keep our community strong. I'm gonna work hard to protect your priorities and your rights, and to support our small businesses and to protect our communities, to grow our economic investments in good schools, our roads to ensure compassionate care for our elderly and people with disabilities. I hope to earn your vote this election and in, in, in gaining your trust that I'm the best person to represent you in the Minnesota Senate. My name is John Hoffman and I'm asking for your vote November 8th. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do want to mention there were candidates that were unable to be here tonight. Karen at Atia and um, Scott Simmons for the 34th and Brad Kohler for the 38th district. We'd like to thank you as the audience for coming tonight and our internet audience for viewing. We would especially like to thank the candidates for being part of this process and for being willing to serve our community. We'd also like to thank our friends at CCX Media for continued support of the League of Women Voter Forums and our shared mission to provide nonpartisan information for voters to get to know the people who wish to represent us. I would like to remind you that the views expressed in this forum were those of the candidates and not those of the Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove League of Women Voters. Remember, if we could not get to your question um, or you have further questions for the candidates, we invite you to contact them directly with your, with your questions. 
uh, information about your candidates is also going to be found on vote411.org. Please remember to vote on Tuesday, November 8th, or before, um, as your vote truly counts. Thank you, and have a good evening. Be safe. Of the Brooklyn Park Osseo Maple Grove League of Women Voters, I would like to welcome you to the Senate District 38 Candidate Forum. I'm Cindy Shevlin Woodcock, moderator for tonight's discussion. The forum will run from now until 8 o'clock. The Brooklyn Park Osseo Maple Grove League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. The League Voters has a long-standing history of providing unbiased candidate and issue information that is widely used by voters regardless of their political beliefs. We sponsor tonight's forum as a public service to the community. It is your opportunity to hear the candidates discuss important issues face to face. Views expressed tonight are those of the candidates and not of the Brooklyn Park Osseo Maple Grove League of Women Voters. We will start the forum with opening statements. Each candidate will be given two minutes for their opening sta and closing statements. Opening statements will be in alphabetical order, whereas closing statements will be in a random order. Throughout the forum, the order for questioning will be rotated. Uh, candidates will have one minute to respond to questions. Candidates, please note there are timekeepers who will signal you by raising the signs when you have 30 seconds left, or excuse me, 15 seconds left. I better take that out of my notes here. Um, 15 seconds and then when it's time to stop talking. You can finish your sentence, but then you need to stop talking. Um, let us begin with opening statements from each candidate. Please begin, it will be, the order will be uh, Robert Marvin, Mike Nelson, Mary O'Connor, Susan Pa and Samantha Vane. Okay, so, okay, we need to be quiet. Remember, we're being recorded, so, all right. I'm able to hear you. <laughs> Do you have your microphone on? Because it's being recorded by CCX, so. So wasn't on? No, it's, yeah, push the button. Look the red light here, so push the button. All right, so it, it's there you on. Go. All right, so I'll start over again. I, I'm generally pretty pithy, so I'm not going to spend two minutes anyway. But my, my name is Robert Marvin. I'm running for Minnesota House in Brooklyn Center, in the southern part of Brooklyn Park. I'm kind of not used to being. You know, this, they said this was being announced, being alphabetical order, right? You know, they said it start off with the lower number. Well, I'm I'm an M, right? Right? You know, right? <laughs> right? You know, I, I'm used to being right dead nuts centered in the alphabetical order. Either way, you know, I'm not used to being first, so. This is kind of where we got five people here, and I'm actually the first person. So all, all of us all of us have these high letters. So that's pretty cool. But I, I'm running. Basically, the, the reason I'm running for for this office is because my city has really been struggling a lot uh, with all, all kinds of things. People see us on the news a lot, uh, and people know um, we we've had some real problems. And this has been going on for a long time. Our city has the highest tax rates as the city. Sorry. <laughs> I was getting waved at, but the, the timekeeper is the ones right here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we have, the high, we have some of the lowest incomes, we have the, some of the highest tax rates, and um, property values are some of the lowest. And I, I basically think that we need as, a, as people to stand up and fight for the, the people who live in my city, Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, the southern portions. And that's why I'm running. So I'm hoping that people will vote for me in November. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Nelson. There we go. Hi, I'm State Representative Michael Nelson. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn Center, and I've lived in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center area most of my life. I was a member of the first graduating class from Park Center High School, and I graduated from Hennepin Technical College. I participated with my three sons in the Brooklyn Park Athletic Association uh, with the youth sports, and I was a Boy, Boy Scout leader at the Brooklyn United Methodist Church. I was an active member of my Carpenters Union, 
serving as every position from delegate to the financial secretary business manager of the local. I currently serve on the Transportation Finance Committee, the Labor, Industry Vet and Veterans Affairs Committee, and I am the chair of the State Government Finance, Com Finance and Elections Committee. I also serve on the Pension Commission. It has been my honor and privilege to serve as you as your representative in the Minnesota House of Representatives, working on, import on important issues for Brooklyn Park and now Osseo. Thank you. Mary O'Connor. My name is Mary O'Connor. I'm running for Senator in District 38, which is Brooklyn Center, Southwest Brooklyn Park, and Osseo. Thank you to the League of Minnesota Voters for having this forum. I've lived in Brooklyn Center for 24 years. I was on the Brooklyn Center Council for one term. I was a member of the Charter Commission Committee for several years. I volunteered at several schools in Brooklyn Center. I have a certificate in information systems from the University of Minnesota, and I worked at the university, and I'm now retired. I have attended many meetings of the legislature over the years, and I have testified several times on different topics. I have learned about tax rules by doing my family's tax returns over the years. Once I saw how insanely complicated the tax rules are, I studied them further to try to understand them better. I realized how important it is to elect officials who are willing to change them. The issues I want to work on are making taxes fair and simple, taking back our freedoms and responsibilities from government, making our schools more successful and less expensive, reducing criminal behavior, and lowering the cost of health care. Thank you, Mary. Susan? I want to first thank uh, the League of Women Voters for putting on this candidate forum. Uh, my husband and I have lived in Brooklyn Park for over 16 years and raised our four children here. And for as long as I can remember, I've always had a passion for community service uh, and giving back. And it really stems from uh, my story is uh, coming to America as a refugee and really living most of my childhood below the poverty line. I remember the first time my mom took me uh, with her to our local church uh, to uh, get some free clothes for our family. Uh, it was used, but I didn't care. I was six years old and I was just happy to get something new to wear to school. Um, Throughout my childhood, what I have seen and experienced is compassion and kindness from people. And I remember, even as young as I was, I remember looking at these people and saying, someday I'm going to be just like those good people right there, and I'm going to help others. And so I've spent all of my adult life doing just that, what that little six-year-old girl thought. Uh, I volunteered and served in my community for over 20 years in many different roles. I've advocated, organized, and built community power to uplift the lives of people, and especially families, especially women and girls. My passion and my work have led me to pursue public service and being a voice for the people, an advocate for the people, and that's why I'm running for state senate. It's because I really believe that good policies equals good outcomes for all. I currently serve as a mayor pro tem in the city of Brooklyn Park, and I have been elected twice to the city council representing the West District. I serve on many boards and commissions, but the two that I've served the longest with is the Brooklyn Bridge Alliance Board and the Economic and Development Authority. Thank you. Samantha Vang. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for organizing this forum. It's really important that we continue to engage our fellow citizens to participate in um, local governments. Uh, I'm Samantha Vang, a state representative of District 40B that will now be on District 38B uh, on this year's ballot, and that is Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park area. Uh, I've been a longtime Brooklyn Center resident. Uh, I am currently the vice chair of the Agriculture Policy and Finance Committee. I am a committee member on uh, judiciary and public safety and, uh, and part of the redistricting committee. Uh, I uh, had the pleasure to be the former chair of the first ever Minnesota Asian Pacific Caucus, along with the uh, a former chair of the People of Color Indigenous Caucus. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing to serve uh, you all 
and uh, I'm happy and once again want to thank every each and every single one of you for being here today uh, to participate in our uh, elections. Thank you. Thank you for your opening statements and giving the audience a chance to learn a little bit about you. Now we'll start with the first question, um, which was received from the audience. This will be, um, I believe we'll try to cover about 10 questions. Um, remember, you have one minute to respond. The order will be Samantha Vang, Mary O'Connor, Robert Marvin, Mike Nelson, and Susan Pa. So the question is, <clears throat> How can the state assist school districts in hiring the staff they need without lowering the qualifications or standards? One of my first campaign priorities uh, when I first ran for office is to make sure that our schools are fully funded. Uh, our public schools uh, need good investments from the states. Uh, as we all know, um, and I hear from teachers and students every single day of uh, the mental health support needs that are, are occurring, uh, especially uh, since during the pandemic, um, how teachers are advocating for smaller classroom sizes. Um, and I understand the needs of the schools, and I uh, am happy to represent four, four school districts uh, in, in District uh, 40B. And uh, the state must play a role in making sure that the school, schools are fully funded and getting the resources they need to support our students and our families. Thank you. Mary? I believe that we can reduce the amount we spend on public schools, so therefore I think there'll be enough staff there. Because I think we should just concentrate on academic classes and some vocational classes in high school. And the other things that are taught at the schools should be done at home with the parents. So we can actually cut the cost of our public education and I think we'll have plenty of staff as long as we have the good teachers there to teach the academic classes. Thank you. Uh, Robert? I believe the question was uh, how do we help? Yeah, I can repeat it if you want. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. How can the state assist school districts in hiring the staff they need without lowering the qualifications or standards? Well, I basically think that to, to help to help them get more staff and hire more staff, one of the easiest ways is for the government to get out of their way and to reduce the requirements and the regulations and the complexities of hiring staff. And to some extent, that might be the dealing with the licensure and so forth, making it easier for them to get licensed and to be qualified to do these uh, various positions. Um, the, the, only way, the only way for you to uh, make it easier for you to get staff is to, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're having staff shortages, you have to make sure that the, uh, you can also work on trying to help train more people that are qualified that meet the requirements. But basically, I think the, the biggest way to help get more uh, staffing for the schools is to make it less complicated for the schools to do that. Thank you. Mike? Thank you for the question. Um, this is a, a complex question, and the easy answer is say we need to fully fund our schools to give them more money, the school districts more money so they're able to hire more teachers. But this is part of a, a couple of things that have been going on within our society. One is there's a worker shortage across the board. We can't hire cops. We can't get carpenters. We can't get electricians. There's just a not as the number of people going into these fields and even the, the, the people out there to draw from. The other problem we're having with teachers, and this is something we're now experiencing with police officers, for about 30 years, every problem that's in the world, we blame it on the teachers. We've been beating on them for years. So people look at that coming out of college and say, do I want to be a teacher and make this much money, or do I want to be a, something else in business and make a whole lot more money that I can easily pay off my student loans? So this is something we need to go back to respecting teachers for what they do. They, they're the ones that teach our, our youth. Those are the ones teaching the people that are gonna take over for all of us. And so with that, I think that's a very complex question. Thank you. Susan. So I hear from uh, many of my friends and people that I know in the education field. And one of the things that keeps coming up over and over again is um, the support staff that they have at the schools make less than people flipping burgers these days. <coughs> 
that's not okay. The other thing is a lot of these positions are part-time with no benefits, and that's not okay, because who would want to work? And every day they're expected to educate and help our children, yet they can barely take care of themselves and their own families. So one is it starts with think, rethinking these positions and offering them to be full-time with benefits making sure that we increase the wages so that they are making livable wages. That's important. And that means that we have to fully fund our education so that we can support our schools and uh, make sure that they can support and educate our children. Thank you. All right, so we will go on to question two. The order of response is Susan, Samantha, Mike Nelson, Robert, and Mary. And the question is, how long have you lived in the district and what was your community, uh, what has your community involvement been? So I've lived uh, here for a little bit over 16 years. I've served on the city council for six years, two terms. Uh, prior to that, I have been involved in the community on boards and commissions. Um, serving nonprofits here in this community. I've just volunteered and served in so many capacities with uh, our organizations and our community groups. And that's always been something that I've done my whole adult life is just giving back to the community. Because like I said, I grew up really looking at people who uh, gave their time to the community as heroes, uh, as a young child who benefited from a lot of these programs. And I always said I wanted to be one of those I gave back. Uh, so that's been uh, the work that I've done. Thank you. Samantha? Could you repeat the question again? Sure. I'm sorry I put a cough drop in my mouth. <clears throat> How long have you lived in the district and what has your community involvement been? Thank you. Uh, I've lived in the district for probably by now uh, nearly over a decade, uh, just over a decade. And uh, my community, before I ran for office, uh, I was actually uh, one of the first uh, Northwest suburban organizers here, uh, where I've organized, worked on nonpartisan campaigns, worked closely uh, with the league uh, at that time to engage uh, voters, non-traditional voters, to get out the vote. Um, and, and I'm proud that I was able to build a, an Asian American coalition where we've helped support over 6,000 uh, voters, often for the first time, to go out and vote. Um, and it's uh, been truly a blessing to see the uh, kind of um, uh, the Asian American uh, representation being uh, put on the map in terms of uh, being involved in, in politics and over the years. And so I'm, I'm happy to be a, a part of that role. And, and since then, I've always been continued to, um, uh, in my public service role, state representative work uh, through um, various committees and to serve um, the city of Broken Center. Thank you. Um, Mike Nelson. Thank you for the question. Um, I kind of chuckled when, earlier when people were talking about how long they lived here. Um, like I said, I grew up in Brooklyn Center. My parents moved to Brooklyn Center in 1957. And I'm not going to tell you how old I was because then you'll start doing math. Um, <laughs> um, and I've lived in my current house since 1986, so well over 30 years. Um, like I said earlier, I've been involved with my sons in the Brooklyn Park Athletic Association when they participated in that. Um, my sons went through scouts at the Brooklyn Center, the Brookdale or the Brooklyn United Methodist Church, which is in Brooklyn Center. Um, I've been out here most of my life, and, and um, that's, that's been my involvement. So thank you. Thank you. Robert? Am, am I on? Okay. Because yep. the, the, the light was. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long I've been living here because it's hard for me to figure this out because I was just was trying to do the math in my head because uh, my family's been living in this area for well over 30 years. Um, really, um, since the late 1980s, um, the, first, the first person I remember voting for um, was Jesse Ventura for, uh, for mayor of Brooklyn Park. I'm not sure what year that was. 
But um, he, I didn't know he ran against a Republican. I guess it was Krauthammer or something like that. And um, he came, the reason I voted for Jesse Ventura was because he, he came to my door, knocked on my door, and he said, my name is Jesse Ventura, and please vote for me, and I, and I did. So that would have been like 1988 or something like that. And I, I've had my house that I live in now since um, probably 25 years. So I've been involved in many, 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 many I'm, I'm going too slow, many, 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 many different groups, scouts and uh, lake associations. And I've probably been president of 20 different things and I'm currently president of quite a few. So I've been very, very active in the community too. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. I've lived in Brooklyn Center for 24 years. I was a, a member of the, I was on the Brooklyn Center Council for one term. I was a member of the Charter Committee for several years. I did some volunteer work at the Brooklyn Park Historical Society. Uh, I volunteered at several schools, Earl Brown School, um, the high school, and uh, Evergreen School. And I've testified, well, I've attended many meetings of the legislature because I've had an interest in different topics for years. So I've test attended many of the legislature meetings and I've testified several times on taxes and um, the pension and some other things. Um, so those are mostly what I've done around Brooklyn Center. Thank you. Question three, the order will be Mary, Robert, Susan, Samantha, and Mike Nelson. What is your perspective on conversion of Highway 252 to a six-lane freeway? Well, I don't like, I've heard there's some deaths on, on 252, and I know when you try to get onto 252, you have to merge with oncoming traffic, and that is, I can see where that's dangerous. Otherwise, I think it works pretty well the way it is. It's gonna take some homes away, it's gonna build some bridges, so I don't really like the idea of renovating it, and I think it'll cost a lot of money. Okay, um, Robert. Um, my family's lived right along 252. My, my mom lives still lives there, right near there, and um, you know, basically, it's an extremely busy road. And I, I, my guess is, I think currently it's two lanes both ways, and you're saying it's being, talking about converting it to three lanes both ways. Um, my, my, it, it's, it's inevitable, it's inevitable that uh, with development and increasing need for transportation and stuff, I, I live along Highway 100 right now. It, it was necessary to upgrade Highway 100, and you look at Highway 100, and Highway 100's bottlenecked really bad. Um, so I think it's, you know, de progress is, it's part of the thing. We, we, we potentially have to consider increasing 252. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? For a long time, we've had deaths um, occur at Highway 252. We've had safety issues, tons of accidents there. We know that currently the way that Highway 252 is, is not something that is safe for drivers or pedestrians. So something has to change. Doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a six uh, lane highway. There are many design plans right now uh, in the works and out in the community for the community to give input to. There has been environmental studies done. And so I think that there's a lot of options that we have. Again, we're gonna need the whole entire community to give input. And I think that because of the community engagement and input we have received, we've actually made a lot of great improvements to that original plan. Uh, but I look forward to the day that that, that that highway becomes safer for all of us to drive on. Thank you. Um, Samantha. I agree with the remarks of uh, Susan F Pa. Um, there is currently a process, uh, environmental impact uh, review process right now, and I encourage um, fellow citizens to participate and provide the input. Uh, I agree that uh, 252 needs to be safer, um, and we can only do that by uh, asking all of you uh, for uh, your input on what we can do to make it safer for everybody else. And so I encourage everyone to uh, participate in the process, and, um, and we'll see what the final results look like. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. Um, I also support the uh, 
process of uh, upgrading Highway 252. All we have to do is look back at when, the, when 252 was first built. Um, there was this argument going on whether we leave it as a lane with, with stoplights like it is now uh, or make it a throughway with limited access with bridges on and off. And in the, one of the first years after this, 252 was open and traffic's gotten a whole lot worse since then. Um, all you got to do is look down here on the 85th and 252. There's a, a pedestrian walkway because a young girl trying to cross 252 was killed. Um, this one of the worst intersect or one of the worst stretches of highway that we have in the state. The 66th intersection has one of the highest accident rates in the state. We need to do things that we can do what we have to do to get this upgraded to make it safer for again both the, the drivers going through there, the drivers that live in the area that are coming home on that, and the pedestrians that want to cross it. Thank you. Question four. Uh, Mike Nelson, Susan Fa, uh, Samantha Vang, Mary O'Connor, and uh, Robert Marvin. What do you plan, or how do you plan to make taxes fair and simple? Taxes fair and simple. That's a, sort of an oxymoron when you're trying to say the are two in some ways two equally directions to go. Part of the complexity in our tax laws are having to do with what we give people credit for, what we don't tax them on, and that, that's what makes it complex and not simple. Um, currently our, our tax system is set up that when the federal government changes, we, what we're known as a compliance state, we comply with what the federal government does, um, and that's then so that when our, our state, our local taxes then, our state taxes are simple to do, it's basically you write what you pay for the federal government over on the other one line, and then it's, it goes from there to how much you pay to the state. So I don't know how much simpler we can get that way for the state taxes, um, but some of the reasons why our taxes seem to be complex is because of certain incentives and things that we want to do as a state where we pass incentives to do things that we want to get done, and they get a tax break for that. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Susan. Well, I think it can uh, talk to the fairness of it. I don't know if I could talk to making it simple because it's very complicated. Uh, but I would say that uh, top income earners need to pay their, their fair share. Um, so does corporations. There, we have way too many uh, loopholes for corporations uh, and they're not paying their fair share as well. Um, and so those things have to change because I think the regular folks, the regular working class are the ones that are carrying the heavy weight of our taxes and that should not be the case. Thank you. Uh, Samantha. Thank you. Uh, I definitely agree that uh, wealthy corporations should uh, pay their fair share of the taxes. Uh, one example that we can look at is um, the President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, uh, where um, he has no family making less than $400,000 will see their taxes go up a penny. Um, and while we're still able to see our healthcare costs, prescription drug costs, and energy costs go down. So I think that's really important that um, I know that in the city of Brooklyn Center, we are one of the more tax burdened cities, um, and we need help from the state to make sure that we can um, rein in uh, lowering our property taxes uh, and, and continue to uh, provide basic maintenance such as um, uh, firefighters and police and public safety and basic um, street maintenance for our um, residents here in, in Brooklyn Center. So thank you. Thank you. Mary? I think we could start with eliminating tax expenditures. Those give some groups of people a tax benefit and other people don't get it. So just eliminate all of those. Uh, capital gains should, should be taxed as ordinary income, not lower. Um, this would be a federal change, but I think Social Security taxes should be done on all income, even uh, investment income, and above 142000 All income should be taxed with Social Security taxes and um, Medicare taxes, but it could be lowered 
because if we tax everybody the same way, it could be lowered and not be six point or seven point some percent. Um, employee benefits should be taxed because some people don't get employee benefits, so they'd pay their taxes on all their income. So instead, we should tax employee benefits. And then in property taxes, I think they should be the same class for all sorts of property. Thank you. Thank you. Robert. Uh, can we get the question again? I think we sure. kind of went off on a tangent. <clears throat> How do you plan to make taxes fair and simple? Um, I, I basically think um, simple, like Mike's saying, and basically our taxes are pretty simple because we just take the t uh, 1040 schedule and practically go over to the M1 and it's pretty simple. But basically the, the fairness thing um, is what I would focus more on. And Brooklyn Center is, the high, as a city, has the highest effective tax rates, the highest property tax rates of any metro. I, I haven't done the research on this for this particular year, but every every year for the past quite a few years, that's been the case. And um, and, and basically, fairness is I'd be working on trying to um, reduce effectively the effective tax rates that our citizens are paying. And the city of Brooklyn Center people are some of the poorest people in the entire metro and are paying some of the highest taxes of anybody. So, so to me, having the poorest people paying the highest taxes is kind of unfair. A, a lot of time, there, there, a lot of people are talking for high rich people paying more taxes. I would be in, in you know, wanting to fight for the people in Brooklyn Center not having to pay the most. Thank you. Thank you. This will be the last question. <laughs> yeah, knock it off. You go. <laughs> for this position. And the order will be Robert, Samantha, Susan, Mary O'Connor, and Mike Nelson. I had apologies, can I take the question again? Sure. Why are you the best candidate for this position? Well, you know, being claiming to be the best is, is something I, I don't like to claim to be the best at anything. Um, be, I, I try hard, and I listen to people, and I'm approachable. So, so I wouldn't want to claim to be the best at, at anything. I, I, I try to be really good at what I do. I try to be really conscientious. I try, I'm an engineer. That's my basic thing. Um, a lot of people will say that I'm extremely good at being an engineer, but I would not say that I'm the best at anything because you know people aren't always the best. But um, you try hard at all the things that you do, and what you try to do is try to be approachable. You try to be, try to listen to people. You try to work hard. You try to figure out the nuts and bolts of what's going on, and you try to uh, make things more efficient. Try to uh, streamline things, and uh, you know, and and respond to the people who, who we're looking for in, in our in our constituency. And my whole goal would be be looking out for the residents of Brooklyn Center and Southern Brooklyn Park and trying to represent them as best I could. Thank you. <clears throat> the next person is Samantha. Uh, shortly after I, I finished my first term in office, uh, the pandemic happened. And as uh, no one really expected running for office, well, we'll be running during a pandemic. And I'm um, happy to say with the work of uh, me and my colleagues, uh, we responded quickly uh, to make sure that everyone uh, is safe, uh, is able to transition through a really <coughs> rough, rough time. Um, and and uh, along with that, we have uh, gone through uh, to civil unrest. And at a time when leadership is needed, we all we stepped up uh, to govern the state and to make sure that uh, there is, um, uh, everyone's needs are met uh, and that we uh, are able to um, listen to everyone at the table. And so uh, serving through uh, has been my, my honor and I've, uh, have the experience and the leadership to make sure that we can respond to people quickly and safely. Thank you. Mary? I think that most members in Brooklyn Center and Brooklyn Park and Osseo are interested in the issues that I'm interested in, so I, I want to work on them, and I think they would agree that they need to be worked on, and that is making taxes fair and simple, because they're so complicated now. 
that's just really terrible. Uh, I think they, we need to take back our freedoms from government and our responsibilities also, because government likes to do things for us that we should be doing for ourselves. Uh, making our schools more successful, uh, which is everybody wants to do that, and then they are very, very expensive, so if we can make it less expensive, that would be good too. Reducing criminal behavior, um, I think we are all interested in doing that, and lowering the cost of health care. And uh, lowering the cost of health care, I would do by uh, reducing the amount of insurance we have, because insurance makes health care very expensive. So if we can reduce the amount and only get major medical, I think eventually we can, we can lower, lower the cost. Thank you. Mike Nelson. It's a very in-depth question, I, and I think I, like, like uh, Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Marvin, that the, uh, I don't know if I'm the best person. I mean, I've, I've been in this office, I, and what I try and do is I try and listen. Um, for me to judge that I'm the best, I don't know. That's something I leave to the voters on, on election day. But if I'm elected, I will listen to your, your, your issues. I will try and work with you on the issues, work with you to try and um, solve the issues you have or direct to, the, to where those issues can be served, um, served best. Um, my, I've always had an open door policy. I respond to my emails that I get, or letters we get from constituents and phone calls. So I guess that's, if that makes me the best for the position, that, that's it. But I, I don't like, I'm, I'm not one that likes to toot my own horn and say, I'm the best at this or the best at that. Um, I think that's, I'm, I'm not that conceited of a person. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for closing statements. Remember, you have two minutes. Cindy. You forgot me. It's all oh, right. no. Oh, I did that last time, too. That's what you See, I'm kind of like, you know, watching the clock. Sorry, Susan. It's all right. I know I it'll be a brilliant response. I didn't want to miss my response. chance at telling people why I'm yeah. the best. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, again, you know, I agree that I don't know if I'm really the, you know, can say that you're the best. But one of the things that's always been important to me is really that I truly, want, I truly have a heart and a passion to serve. I mean, that's important to me. At my core, I'm that way. I'm responsive to people when they contact me. I really listen to people, and I listen to understand. And, and I truly believe that we create better policies when we have everyone's input and we consider the perspective and views of everyone. Um, and policies, policies are better when we actually have people involved in that. It, it, no, no policy can be created that works for everyone in silo. Um, and so that's one of the things that I truly believe as policymakers, um, that someone, people have to understand that when they're in this role, they're representing a huge group of people. Um, and it isn't just about their own personal experience or thoughts or agenda. Thank you. All right, now candidates will have the opportunity to have two minutes for your closing statements to summarize your qualifications and the positions you're running for. And the order is Mike Nelson, Mary O'Connor, Robert Barron, uh, Susan, and Samantha. Turn so, the mic on. Um, First, I want to thank the League for holding this forum. Um, my mother was a long time active in the League of Women Voters, and it, uh, one of her biggest regrets was having to drop out when she had to go back to work after my father passed away. Good jobs that pay livable wages are always been the key to a strong Minnesota economy. We need to continue to do what we can to get our citizens back to work and get enough employees for our, our, our employers. Most of the pro budget problems we've had in the past been caused by drops in revenue and sales tax revenues, and those are directly tied to when people are working, they can, they can buy the things they need. Um, we need to continue to invest in our infrastructure by repairing our roads and bridges, and we also need to invest in our people, and we do that through education, both through um, um, K-12 and higher ed. If re-elected, I will continue to work with the residents of Brooklyn Park and now Osseo and my colleagues in the House to deliver the type of Minnesota we can all be proud of. And I want to thank you for your passport and I ask you for your vote on November 8th.
Thank you. Mary O'Connor. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for having this forum. I really do appreciate it. I'm Mary O'Connor running for Senator in District 38, which is Brooklyn Center, Southwest Brooklyn Park, and Osseo. And I've gone through my the five issues that I want to work on, and I think everybody's interested in these, making taxes fair and simple, taking back our freedoms and responsibilities from government, and one of those freedoms should be to be able to uh, use marijuana as we see fit. So I think we should decriminalize marijuana and then also release nonviolent sellers of marijuana from prison. Making our schools more successful, I think we all want that and I think they can be less expensive. Reducing criminal behavior and lowering the cost of health care. And um, something I'd suggest for the legislature since they weren't able to get a lot of their bills passed last year is that each legislature should be able to present one bill in committee before somebody else presents a second bill. So we are all equal legislators. We all should be able to present a bill and not be told that we're in a minority where we can't. And then that bill should be voted on in committee, and if it passes, it should go to the other body. And, uh, and also, I think legislators should be respectful of other legislators to keep their speeches concise and timely. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Marvin. Well, I wanted to thank the League of Women Voters in the audience, and I really wanted to thank my fellow fellow candidates. I think this has been a very amicable and very pleasant uh, uh, forum, and I think people have uh, put out a lot of good information. I actually think that the previous forum was really good, too. I think I learned a little bit from both, uh, both the speakers uh, on the previous one as well. Um, but basically, I think that, you know, stuff like this is really good and people are, you know, and, 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 and I guess the reason I'm running is I'm hoping that people start being more amicable and getting along more and being more approachable and trying to figure out how to solve these problems. And my, my biggest goal would be to try to reduce complexities, try to reduce tax rates, especially for my, my local residents, try to look out for the interests of my local residents. Um, I, I would be big on, on not spending more. Um, I basically don't believe this idea of this, this surplus is something that should be spent. I, I basically believe that this surplus is something that shouldn't have been collected. And they should, we'd be better off not taxing people so heavily. And I, I really think that um, we need to work on looking out for the interests of people and simplifying their lives and not having the government controlling everything all the time. And, um, and basically trying to, to work things out. And I also am more interested in local government than, than, than the, this big central government. I think that the local should take more responsibility for it. So, but um, please vote for me in November. And uh, one of the things that I would try to do is be approachable. And um, one of the things that I guess would make me kind of unpopular with the Republicans is um, I'm, I'm a hard Republican, everybody knows that. But I, I would be representing a district that's very, very Democrat, right? And um, you know, and I, my duty would be to represent the people in Brooklyn Center, and that that might, in many cases, go against what the Republicans want. So I think I would be a really good uh, person there who might not be completely popular with my own party. Thank you. I didn't forget you this time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I want to first thank everyone for coming out tonight and those watching at home as well for your time. I'm uh, the product of good legislation. I'm the product of good uh, programs and a community that cares about one another. Uh, and that is why I'm running for state senate. There's so much at stake this election and it is so important that we must protect reproductive rights we must invest in our education, um, our children's future. We must pass common sense gun legislation. We must provide healthcare access for all. And we must commit to keeping our air and water clean, strengthening our conservation programs and developing energy efficient technologies. You know, I really look forward to all of us coming together to invest in our future I welcome all of you to connect with me uh, on my website, on my email, Senate at gmail.com. I invite you to call me uh, with any questions and also to talk about what the issues are that's important to you 
uh, that you want to see me fight for. Uh, so this election, I ask for your vote, and I'm hoping that I can earn your support and your vote. Thank you. Samantha. Once again, thank you to the League and to everyone here tonight. Your time is greatly appreciated. I understand the everyday challenges families are facing because I'm listening and I'm working to find solutions. We can create a better future for all of us if we focus on the issues that matter most and work together to get things done. We can help families better afford their lives by working to reduce the cost of health care and prescription drugs and hold big corporations accountable for their role in rising prices. We can fully fund our local schools and improve opportunities for our children. We can reduce gun violence and improve safety in our communities. We can protect and must protect women's access to health care. And I will work for these issues and more uh, so we can build a better district and a better Minnesota. Once again, I'm Samantha Vang, your state representative. I'm running for re-election, and I ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. The League of Women Voters would like to thank you all for coming tonight and for our audience that's viewing. Uh, we would especially like to thank the candidates for being here and being part of the process and for being willing to serve our community. We'd like to also thank our friends at CCX Media for continued support of the League of Women Voter Forums and our shared mission to provide nonpartisan information to, to, for voters to get to know the, the people who wish to represent them. I would like to remind you that the uh, views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the Brooklyn Park, Maple Grove, Os oops, Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove League of Women Voters. Remember, if you could not get your question asked tonight, um, or if you have further questions, you may kind of can't, uh, you are invited to, I'm having trouble saying this word, contact the candidates directly. Information about your candidates is also found on vote411.org. Remember to vote on or before Tuesday, November 8th, as your vote truly counts. Thank you, have a good evening, and be safe.